So it's been a couple of weeks since I've had an opportunity to do a, one of these. Uh, <clears throat> the weather has been going up and down all over the place, so my voice has kind of come, come and gone, but it's nothing like the, the illness I was having last winter that almost killed me. Uh, but I've been pretty busy on this end. Uh, I was going through this temporary agency, getting temporary jobs here and there, and now I look like uh, I'm pretty blind up for a, a solid full-time position with the place I had an interview today right after I got off work. I've been starting work at 5 o'clock in the morning and getting off at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, which I haven't got used to getting up quite that early yet. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I, I stumbled across this article uh, that uh, was appropriately titled, Are Anti-AA Blogs Hateful or Helpful? And while I will have to say that the, the, the writer of this particular article, it uh, let me see exactly where it comes from. Oh, it's After Party Magazine, and it's uh, Rehab. It, it's pretty much pro-AA uh, for the most part. Uh, but there's a couple of things I'd like to touch on here. Uh, even though I, I do think that she kind of strives to be fair, it's pretty obvious the pro-AA bias is seeping through. Can't fully blame someone for that, uh, but I, there's a couple of things I want to take exception with on here, so I'm going to start with that. It's, and again, the title of the article is, Are Anti-AA Blogs Hateful or Helpful? And the writer begins with, whether you like it or not, there are scores of blogs and websites, some more over the top than others. Depends on what you call over the top, I would add. Uh, aimed at discouraging people from attending AA, some seem bent on radicalizing former members into anti-AA activists or haters, while others seem cool just promoting awareness that AA isn't the only game in town and that you can stay sober outside the rooms just fine. Okay, I would... First of all, I'd like to say that's a bit of what I'd call a, fa a false dichotomy. You're saying it's an either-or proposition. Either you got these people out here trying to create anti-AA activists and uh, trying to create some kind of you know malicious vitriol towards AA, or you got these people that's just trying to simply let you know it's not the only game in town, uh, excluding all the variables in between. What would I classify myself as? Well. I think anybody who's watched this channel for any period of time would know I'm pretty much anti-AA altogether. Uh, but I'm not so much interested in mobilizing some army of, you know, of anti-AA people out there to, to, uh, to go to war against it or something like that. What I'm encouraging people to do is take a look at what I feel is very harmful uh, practices that it teaches and uh, the... The, uh, the flaws itself in the way that it approaches addiction, the fact that it's outdated and antiquated and it hasn't been updated for almost 80 some odd years, the fact that it teaches you that you're helpless and powerless and that you're morally defective and spiritually inept and that you as a human being are completely and utterly flawed without uh, their program dictating to you what is right, what is wrong, what is moral or immoral and telling you that you have to read one book, one text for the rest of your life in order to even have any kind of hope whatsoever of not get, drinking yourself to death and that you have to sacrifice your personal ambitions uh, for the greater good of the group. I find uh, the doctrine, the dogma uh, that it preaches to be overtly harmful. And what I'm encouraging people to do with this channel is to take a look at the stuff you're being preached to and the guilt trips that it puts you on uh, and, and, and really examine that and, and, and question whether or not that maybe just maybe you're not really some spiritually bankrupt, self-centered individual uh, driven by a hundred forms of fear and character defects. Maybe you're just a person uh, like I was and had a, a, a poor impulse control when it comes to their addictions and who sought refuge in the bottle to escape some of their everyday problems until it became, you know, until it became a problem unto itself, alcohol consumption-wise. So I, I wouldn't really go so far as to say, you know, you've got these vitriolic, hate-filled people out there versus the, uh, the people just letting you know it's not the only game in town. I mean, I think you couldn't possibly want to let people know it's not the only game in town without pointing out uh, the inherent flaws of the organization. Maybe she should have thought about the fact that we should look at the problems in AA or something like that and did an article on that. Maybe she has. I don't know. I'm not going to rush to judgment until I've researched it a little bit more, but that's just an opening point. Um, then the uh, writer goes on to say many anti-AA folks are genuinely concerned about how AA has harmed and continues to harm people 
be it through sex harassment or sponsors telling people to get off their medications and stealing guilt or making otherwise materialists believe in and pray to a God to solve all their problems. They argue that AA makes many alcoholics worse and that the program blames members when they relapse, which can lead to further relapse and sometimes suicide. Okay. Those are uh, a large crux to the arguments I put forth, both from personal observation uh, and from things that I've heard other people say all around the world who have been involved in this program, and from the literature itself. Uh, maybe I haven't devoted as much time as I should to all the things that the literature preaches uh, and teaches, but I have touched upon some chapters. If you look at We Agnostics, We Agnostics more or less says... Uh, that if you're a skeptic or that if you're someone who's not willing to swallow what they're telling you hook, line, and sinker, uh, that you're a closed-minded individual and that, you know, you'll probably never overcome drinking uh, and stuff like that. It tells you that if you uh, cannot, try, you know, the literature also tells you you can't trust your own impulses, your own thinking. You, uh, it tells you that, uh, that you have to surrender your will and your life over to a higher power which I think, it's not just materialist, I might add, it might be a lot of people, myself, I'm not an atheist, uh, and I'm not what you would call a materialist in a, in a sense of, in the sense of saying there's nothing beyond, you know, my own material hedonistic pleasures or whatever, I don't know how she's defining materialist here, uh, but I, I wouldn't classify myself as someone who's atheistic and doesn't believe uh, in many things, but at the same time, I have a major problem with a doctrine that tells me that I have to turn my will and my life over uh, to these people uh, whose, whose doctrine I find uh, conflicts with my own personal worldview in a lot of ways. I don't think you necessarily have to be a, a non-believer or, or, or non-spiritual, I guess you could say, to, uh, to say I have a problem with this idea that I've got to turn my life and my will over to something else to run it for me, and in the meantime, I'll turn it over to this group of people to run it for me. Uh, I also would have to point out that the sex harassment, the 13 step in, the people in there that deal drugs, the people in there that rejoice when other people drink themselves to death or relapse or whatever, uh, those are very real issues that go on in AA. These aren't made up exaggerated issues. We're not talking about a case where I take one or two, you know, remote examples of something that's never, ha you know, that very rarely happens and blew them all out of proportion to, to make this sweeping generalization of the program. We're not talking about that at all. We're talking about everyday common occurrences that I saw personally and that people I correspond with over the internet and on social media saw constantly. So, I mean, I, I, I get the, the synopsis that the author is going for here is saying this is kind of the gist of what goes on uh, in the anti-AA blogs and things like that, but uh, I think there's also very real issues and very real concerns, so I want to see if this author uh, cares to address these very real problems. And, uh, and I'm going to go on to the next paragraph. It's important to say here that many active members of AA, a number of whom write for this site, believe AA saved their lives and can therefore save millions of other people. Okay... They are often less vitriolic in their stance than the anti-AA crusaders and therefore tend to not create sites that attack the opposite belief. Well, bullshit. Okay, you're doing the very same thing that you accuse the anti-AA people of doing. And if I sound a little harsh or vitriolic, as you put it, then I, I'm being so because I, I don't like uh, sweeping generalizations of what you're doing there. What you're doing there is saying that in general, AA people tend to be more well-behaved than the people who are against AA. Simply not true. If you've ever been in any arguments uh, with people online or in the social media world, AA people can be some of the most hateful people uh, that you can imagine in terms of attacking your character or in terms of using any kind of logical fallacy to undermine you. Uh, I've had people try to, uh, I've even had people try to, you know, uh, dox, I think is the word, publish my address online or publish my name and stuff like that that are AA people. So, I, you know, just because you're saying that you personally uh, uh, see that anti-AA people are a little bit meaner than AA people, uh, that, that doesn't hold much water with me. And, and as far as you saying that AA people do not create sites to promote their own beliefs or attack the opposite beliefs, uh, AA has plenty of PR in press and radio and films, despite their traditions, on their side. Okay, it's even in pop culture when you turn on the TV, you know, if somebody has a drinking problem, they're in AA. And 
AA is portrayed as this nice little group of people that are all helping each other overcome someone, you know, their problems, overcome their problems by helping each other. So AA people in general don't need to actually make uh, sites demeaning the other side. They've got uh, most of pop culture, the billion dollar a year treatment industry and everything else on their side. So I, I think I think you're kind of stooping towards a character attack there. Now you can, of course, turn this around and say somebody like me making a video talking the way I'm talking is proof of what you're saying. But that's that's not actually something that uh, I would say. I don't consider myself being vitriolic. Am I passionate? Am I passionate about what I've seen and what I've uh, undergone myself, my own personal experiences, and the people I've seen die in those rooms? And yeah. Uh, you know, I have a tendency to get a little emotional about that. Does, to equate that to uh, vitriol or, or you know a lot of hate or something like that, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go that far. I mean, because I'm expressing a, an opposite opinion to yours, and I'm expressing it uh, pretty much in, in in no uncertain terms, that doesn't automatically make me a, a hateful person. Uh, any more than uh, what you're saying that these people here believe AA saved their lives and can therefore save millions of people. That, that That's another attempt to undermine anybody who's against AA. You're saying that AA hasn't killed hundreds of people and AA hasn't been, uh, couldn't be held responsible for the deaths of a lot of people. Like, would you like for me to tell you how many times I've seen people say some have to die those so that others can live when people blow their brains out and die drunk? I mean, you know, see, in my mind, that's more vitriolic than me criticizing a program that has billions of dollars on its side and pop culture on its side. It can afford to take a few punches. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I I'll tell you one thing. I've never on an anti-AA blog celebrated the death of someone in AA who drank themselves to death and saying, well, that's proof. That's proof that AA doesn't work. Unlike the behavior I have seen in some AA meetings where people overdose or commit suicide, the AA members seem overjoyed that that happened. So, you know, let, let, let's just stick to the topic at hand and not get, get, get sidetracked with the who's better than who here. So then it goes on to say, Mr. Orange, a hardline hater. Nah, actually, he was pretty instrumental in helping me. Uh, one of the most long-standing, she says, anti-AA sites is the Orange Papers, where Orange has written dozens of posts that comprise some sort of radical manifesto and online book on the dangers of Alcoholics Anonymous. Not really. Uh, you know, he has dozens of letters of people that wrote to him all the time when he was active, and none of them could ever debunk what he was saying. Since much of what the person says is substantiated by research, Pursuing the Orange Papers might even lead the most devoted AA member to wonder if they unwittingly drunk some obnoxious Kool-Aid. Okay, now you're stooping the character attacks again. You just said that everything he said is actually substantiated by facts. So just because what he writes is something you don't like, or the fact that it might make the most uh, devoted AA members take a look at themselves and say, well, you know, he's got some key points here, doesn't equate to Jim Jones and the Kool-Aid. Okay, <laughs> it just doesn't. Beside that, nobody's forcing anybody to read anti-AA material. Nobody's forcing anybody to go to anti-AA sites. <coughs> you won't see me sitting up here saying, if you don't, if you don't listen to what I'm saying, you're going to die. You know, unlike AA, and, and you know, I can back that up with several quotes from their big book and their literature and the word of Bill Wilson himself that says, if you don't conform to their way of life, you're going to die. So I wouldn't call what he's doing, just because he's calling, uh, pointing out key points about what's wrong with AA, I wouldn't call that uh, Kool-Aid, or put it in this bracket of being something radical like Jim Jones or Charles Manson, or some crazy thing. I mean, I think you're kind of grasping there a little bit with that, and the fact that you have to kind of stoop to a character attack on a guy rather than, you know, take the facts he says, take the things he says, and refute them if you don't like what he's saying. Prove him wrong, you know. This was my first reaction when I stumbled upon him six years ago, she writes, in part because the studies that speak to AA's effectiveness are not mentioned. Uh, on contraire, he points out several people, of course his site is not on right now, you'd have to go to the Wayback Machines, he points out people uh, like George Valiant that went out and tried to prove that AA worked and couldn't come up with a, with a satisfactory figure. In fact, the figure was so abhorrent that he had to turn around and say that, uh, you know, he, he just agreed that people should go to AA because it helped them find God. 
you know, just because Orange Papers isn't promoting AA on his website doesn't automatically discredit him. Uh, you know, if, if you're really going to going to maintain a position, you gotta you gotta present the information. Uh, you can't just look at a site that opposes what you're believing or opposes your confirmation bias and say, well, he's not writing all the good things about me either. Uh, your job is to do that if you're going to defend AA. He, he doesn't have to prove that AA is effective. All he has to do uh, is put forth a substantial amount of proof that AA doesn't work, and his job is accomplished there. So to say that he's not writing long, glowing love letters about how well AA works is not really much of an argument. You're just saying that he's not putting forth the information that you wanted to hear. Uh, but you, again, you could say, okay, Orange Papers never did put out all the good things about AA. You still have not refuted the things he said about AA. You haven't proved him wrong on anything either. Here's a brief excerpt uh, of what he wrote in the 12 Biggest Secrets of AA. The AA dropout rate is terrible. Well, you can see that through empirical observation. If you were in the rooms as long as I had, you saw newcomers just come and go. I mean, you saw people relapse and die all the time. Uh, there was only a small minority of, of old timers that you know held the hierarchy structure. Uh, goes on further to say, most people who come to AA looking for help and quit drinking are recalled by the narrow-minded atmosphere of fundamentalist religion and faith healing. Well, yeah, I mean, the AA meeting room has a revolving door to therapists, judges, and parole officers, many of whom are themselves hidden members of AA or NA, and they are. They're all in the drug court system and the court systems and the treatment centers. Uh, continually send new people to AA, but those newcomers vote with their feet once they see what AA really is. Well, okay, are you going to try to prove him wrong? I mean, that's your conclusion of this paragraph. You're saying Orange Papers, although he's not active anymore, and if you want to read him, you got to go to the Wayback Machine. You're saying that he's a hate-filled dude that's vehement uh, about what he's saying, but you haven't disproved him. You've just taken a couple of quotes, and you said you don't like them, basically. I mean, you know, if you want to counteract what, he, what his statements are, show some proof. Uh, show some proof that he's wrong. The next one says, trying to change people's thinking, and the article goes on. Next up on the list is stinking thinking, which has the subheading of muck rack in the 12-step industry. On the current homepage of the site, the owner addresses the problem of sexual predators in the rooms, which was recently put on blast in the 2015 documentary, The 13th Step by Monica Richardson. Many AAs, including myself back in the day, defended the program with the argument that AA is no more dangerous than any other place in the world. Uh, unfortunately, though, it protects those people. It protects them. Sure, a newcomer might be lured into a sexual assault situation, but couldn't that happen at work, at a movie theater, at a McDonald's, or on a subway? Uh, absolute bullshit. First of all, if, if there's a sex harassment, if, if somebody tries to rape someone in a McDonald's, uh, the police are involved, okay? Somebody calls the cops, or somebody steps in and they, you know, they punch the motherfucker in the head that's trying to do that, uh, or they restrain him and they take him down. Uh, if somebody tried to sexually assault someone at McDonald's, all the McDonald's employees aren't going to come out and surround the person doing the harassing or the rape and say, you know what, if you go to the police about this, this might make McDonald's look bad. And besides, you need to look at your part in that, and you need to look at your situation in that, and how you played a role in that. And by the way, go home tonight and do an inventory. Okay, so that, that's kind of a moot point. That's kind of like saying, uh, you know, this recent thing I was reading about with all these Southern Baptist preachers and, and volunteers that, that had engaged in some pretty uh, heinous acts against innocent members of the congregation. A lot of people were going to argue that by saying, you know, well, that could happen anywhere at any time. You can't blame the organization for that. Uh, not necessarily. When the organization covers for these people, when the organization like AA uses anonymity, to hide these people, to protect these people, then the organization does share some responsibility altogether. Um, when, when I saw guys that I knew for a fact dealt pills to newcomers, uh, when I saw guys that I knew for a fact would steal your wallet, uh, would, would, would sexually harass people and all that, and you point it out and they say, yeah, but he's got 25 years sobriety. He hadn't had a drink in a long time. That's more than you could say. Then yeah, the organization shares some fucking responsibility for that. So to try to pass it off as, well, you could get, 
you know, you could get raped in a library or something like that. that that's really a pathetic argument. That's saying, well, it happens everywhere, so why should we worry about it? Can't blame us for that. It really pisses me off when I hear that. I could make a whole other video topic on that. And then it, she goes on to say, the argument that anyone who enters AA is just as vulnerable as they would be in other public venue is profoundly inaccurate. Well, that's true. It's been drummed into our cultural con consciousness by trusted sources from Ann Landers, Dr. Drew, reality TV, to family doctors and therapists. AA is the only true solution to a debilitating addiction and the only other options are jails, institution, and death. Well, there again, you haven't disproven that because that's the obvious truth. I used to hear that in fucking AA meetings all the time. This is the last house. This is the last stop. If you don't do it, you're going to die. It, it says it in every fucking meeting when they read how it works that, you know, if you can't recover, you just can't be honest. You either can or will not, that you're a mental defective and all this other shit. So again, refute what the site that you're saying is preaching nonsense is saying. Uh, when one enters a public sphere, one is not told to trust his or own instincts as they are in AA meetings. Well, that again is very true. You get in AA meetings and you're told to listen to the old timers. Uh, you're told to uh, turn your will and your life over to other people, to sponsors and all this other stuff, that your best thinking got you there, uh, that you have an alcoholic brain that can't tell the truth from the false, that you can't make your own decisions, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they encourage you to trust these so-called trusted servants that are engaging in all these heinous behaviors. So again, just because you say this site is saying this stinking thinking and you don't like it, you haven't done anything to refute what they're talking about. No one is told to trust people one meets on the bus or the, or the mall, while in AA, newcomers who have a hard time turning their will over to God are told to start by turning it over to a group of drunks. Well, it's true. No one's instructed to trust the guidance of a sponsor, an anonymous stranger with no formal training. And then, actually, the author was kind enough to add, these are solid enough points. Yet, solid enough points. Okay, you can call it solid points all you want to, but as long as it's going on, uh, you haven't actually done anything in behalf of saying that this site is a, is a hateful site that spews vitriol uh, against AA. You haven't actually said, yeah, these are some valid points, but we're not going to worry about that right now. Uh, I'm too far into this to start and stop over, so I just have to turn this down while phone rings. <laughs> all right, let's keep going. Exposition is the name of this game. All right, let's see who she's attacking in this article. And, and by the way, I'll post a copy of that article in the video description when I get done here. Uh, Exposition is the name of this game. Expose AA is another hard-lined anti-AA site. Nah, I didn't really think of it as much. One of the first phrases that pops out at you when you visit the site is, You've been lied to. Above this sentence is a link reading, AA is a cult. Well, there again, I don't call it a hardline AA site. I call it a site that's actually making some valid points. Points that I bet you won't debunk in this article. After clicking the link, you'll read, Even if you're an average adult, you will begin to hear you can no longer make the decisions for your own life. If you're involved with 12-step programs and look at the statement clearly, you'll see you're not making your decisions. The God of your understanding isn't. Instead, others in the program are attempting to do it for you. Well, there again, it's a valid point. You know, it was really weird if you went into a, a meeting and you said, you know, uh, my higher power says that I don't really need to tell my secrets to everybody or my higher power teaches common sense and... Uh, says that I really shouldn't be doing all this stuff that you people are saying to do, or, or my higher power says that i got to put my family, uh, friends or family first, and that's the reason why I'm quitting drinking. AA people will tell you that, that you're delusional. Okay, you know, God in AA only speaks as long as it's lining up with all of what they're saying. As long as it's confirming their own biases and their bullshit, then it's God. But if it doesn't confirm what they're preaching, it's not. I had that time down. Maybe I should just throw it. Damn. Too far gone to start over. So then to go on. Now how can something like this happen in the lives of adults? Surely there are individuals who for whatever reasons actually prefer a way of life that consists of others telling them what to do. Perhaps such people are very ill, very immature, or some other factor. No. Absolutely not. What's going on with a lot of these people who are addicted is that they... They're desperate like I was when I got to AA. I was so desperate for help and so desperate to do something that, uh, you know, I was willing to listen to what people had to say. And people that are in that position are vulnerable. 
and they get taken advantage of. That's what happens to these people. The people in AA are not weak people. That, you know, that I'm talking about the newcomers that get exploited by AA. They're not stupid and they're not weak-minded people that need to be told what to do. What they are is confused people who are desperate for help and they go there to get the help and they get fucked over and exploited. That's what's going on there. Again, the author points out, it's a fair enough argument, though many AAs will argue they do not experience someone telling them what to do. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm not even going to touch that. I'll go on for another 10 minutes. Still, any of them will agree that giving direction is a huge part of the program. Well, now, what do you call giving direction? Do you call giving direction the part where it says if you don't completely conform to their way of life, you sign your own death warrant? Is that called giving direction? Uh, is the part... Uh, where they say that, uh, you know, you must uh, accept our way of life or else, it's in the literature, is that giving directions? So let's not, let, let's dispense with the semantics bullshit game here. I mean, what you're really doing is you're trying to, to, to hide what it really is by using a, a better sounding phrase. Uh, I don't know if anybody likes the British comedians Mitchell and Webb, but uh, there was one little skit where they had organized crime and they were talking about murdering somebody. And uh, one of them is like, uh, you know, why are we using all these ambiguous terms? Why can't we just say we're going to go clip somebody? And the uh, mafia crime boss says, well, it would be better for all the concerned if he met with an unfortunate circumstance. And uh, that's kind of what we're doing here. We're kind of using semantics to kind of dance around what really goes on in those rooms. So, and now it goes, many AAs just give out suggestions to others. Uh, uh, give out suggestions or advice. Others spew out or do, do or drink orders. Uh, it's a fair enough argument. But when I was a sponsor, I kept prefacing my advice with long-winded. Now, I'm not a professional. I don't know everything. And you may not be comfortable with this. And I don't want you to be uncomfortable, X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. I'm not saying you didn't do that to the writer. I'm not saying that you didn't tell your sponsees that. You may have. You may have been one of these rare sponsors that I encountered in the rooms of AA that was actually one of those people that was willing to actually do that. But let me ask you this question. When you would hear old timers sharing in the meetings and they were saying, I don't want to hear a treatment center bullshit. You either do this or you die. Or when some old timer was in there and he was preaching really strong, strident hate towards relapsers and he was telling them that they were going to go out and die because they couldn't follow this and they were on their tirades. Did, did, did you speak up? You know, did you, did you share against what that old timer was saying, even though he had 20 years to say more than you did? Uh, did you tell your sponsees, don't listen to that prick? Did you, did you speak out in the meetings at all about it? Let me ask you this. If you saw an old timer that you knew was, was, was exploiting people or harming people, and uh, you saw him talking about you don't need your sight managed in an AA meeting, did you stand up and call him out on that? Did you say that, uh, yeah, you do need psych meds and you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I don't care if you got 20 years. Did you do any of that? I'm just asking. I'm not saying you didn't, but call me skeptical because I never saw nobody call those bastards out. And then they conclude with the empathetic approach. Another site, one that's very dear to me, called Recovering from Recovery, is dedicated to helping people who want to leave AA, but the site noticeably lacks antagonism or AA bashing. You know... I got to address that before I go, even though I'm going on longer than I realize. AA bashing is actually, uh, for me and my experience and others like me, it's actually a, a healthy part of the recovery process. Why? Because for years in AA, I was told I couldn't criticize it, I couldn't question it, I couldn't speak out against it, I couldn't talk up about it. And, you know, for years I felt like I was guilty. Uh, that I deserved to be drunk and that I couldn't quit drinking because I was such an evil fucking horrible person uh, for thinking bad thoughts about AA. And when I was able to express freedom about what they had done to me, when I was able to speak out and lash back and be angry and give myself permission to have those normal human emotions, that was incredibly liberating for me. So I get a little bit, I, I, I get a little bit of a pet peeve about that when say you don't need to bash AA if you're coming out of it. Sometimes you do need to bash AA, especially the people that have been severely hurt by it. I mean, I, you know, you don't want to hear AA bashing, fine, but, but don't try to talk like everybody who bashes it is some kind of horrible fucking person because a lot of people got hurt through that organization. And then it says, uh, 
On this site, the user known as I Love Life writes intelligent and empathetic posts about how to disengage from AA when you're an active member. Good for them. Uh, and then they, she, the writer offers a couple of excerpts. I can skip over that. And then they mention uh, some other blog or something like that. But then they end it with, sure, it's easy to get pissed off at all the anti-AA stuff if you're a diehard member. But hey, all these bloggers have the First Amendment on their site. In addition to creating tons of backlash, these sites can also help people like me sort out whether they want to stay in AA first place and give them the courage to leave. I guess that's my constitutional right. Well, I'll give you that. You know, uh, in closing, I guess, on your article, I'm not going to read all the rest of it. it. You know, it's pretty much just reiterating what I've talked about. Uh, I'll give you that. You're not trying to shut us down. You're not trying to silence us like some people are, are trying to do. I've encountered AA people that say people like me shouldn't exist. That stuff like the Orange Paper shouldn't exist. They accuse me of killing alcoholics uh, for questioning the holy AA doctrine in the, in the meetings and everything. So I, I'll, I'll give you your conclusion. Uh, and I'll also say that you did try, you, you, you tried uh, to be unobjective there, and of course objectivity is difficult about situations like this. I mean, I sure in the fuck aren't objective. <laughs> you know, when I'm bashing AA, I'm far from being objective and clinical. Uh, so, you know, I can't fault you too much uh, to the writer if you, if you see this video or anything. I can't fault you for that. You tried, you strove for objectivity, something I don't even uh, do most of the time. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, I've read worse articles that attack people that question AA. I've read uh, much more meaner articles. There's a couple of things that irritated me on here, but overall, I mean, yeah, I, I too believe in free speech and I believe you have the right to say what you, you want to say and I have the right to say what I want to say. And as long as you're not taking away my right to speak, I certainly am not going to try to take away your right to speak. The only time I have a problem with some of these uh, pro-AA folks is when they try to shut down people like me or when they say people like me uh, should not be allowed to exist. So I, I, I will give you that. And I'll post a I'll post the link to this article uh, in the video description. And uh, 32 minutes. Okay, I talked a little bit too long. Plus I had the fucking phone going up there and everything. <laughs> anyway, hopefully I'll see you guys next week or in two weeks.